Hi everyone, my name is Kara Rogers. I'm one of the licensed social workers here at the Alzheimer's Foundation of America. So excited to have another Care Connection um, with you all and have the opportunity to present on topics that are ongoing um, during this time. And I'm really excited to have Dr. Judith Beisner here with us. Um, just a little bit about her. She's a, a tenured um, clinical professor at St. John's University um, College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. Um, she also practices as a clinical pharmacist at the Stern Family Center for Rehabilitation um, in the Northwell Health System. And she is a past president of the American Society of Consultant Pharmacists, ASCP. So without further ado, I'm gonna let her get started on our presentation today on medications and your memory. All right, thank you, Kara. Thank you for inviting me to talk about this really important topic. Um, I wish I had really good news and told you that there would be some great stuff that you can take to improve your memory, but unfortunately that's not quite gonna be uh, what we're gonna be talking about. So um, what I do wanna cover is some medications that can actually cause memory loss or confusion, and so medications that we should be avoiding with our older adults. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the FDA-approved medications for Alzheimer's dementia, um, what's in the pipeline, what's not in the pipeline. And then I will talk about some of the supplements that are promoted for memory, but really, what's the truth? And, and I, I say very carefully, buyer beware. Um, and then we'll talk about exercise and symptom management, and then just a general overview of how to manage your medications and talk with your pharmacist and some of the do's and don'ts about safe medication taking. So there are a good number of medications that can cause confusion or memory loss or even temporary memory loss in older adults. And uh, some of these are very common medications that you'll even see you know, in the community pharmacy in the over-the-counter medications. And one of the biggies is diphenhydramine or Benadryl. And you may know it, you see like uh, some of the products, Tylenol PM, Motrin PM, and they all contain diphenhydramine or one of the other antihistamines that we know can cause uh, a lot of side effects in older adults, not just confusion. They're uh, what we call the anticholinergic medication. They're very drying, so you have dry eyes and dry mouth and uh, urinary retention and constipation, but one of the other things is it cause, can cause confusion. We teach them, the students at St. John's, it's you know dry as a bone, blind as a bat, red as a beet, and mad as a hatter. And so really to be cautious, do not buy any of those medications uh, that are the PM ones. Benadryl as an antihistamine is okay in small doses for a short period of time if you're having an allergic reaction to something. Say you break out in a rash from a medication or poison ivy, a small short course, but know that it can cause all those side effects. Uh, but it should not be used as a regular type of uh, antihistamine. We have some of the better ones uh, like uh, the brand name Claritin or Zyrtec. The other class of medications that should also be avoided in older adults are the muscle relaxants. Um, one, some examples are methylcarbamol, cyclobenzaprine, and these are often prescribed in, some, in the emergency room. Someone comes in and they've fallen, they've stra strained the muscle, pull, sprained an ankle, and the, or their back, and the doctors think they're doing something good by helping you with this mus muscle relaxant, but also, again, can cause these anticholinergic effects, this confusion, and also can just make you very sedated also can increase the risk for falls too. So, you know, I say they must make you, they must relax your muscles, but they also kind of make you like into a wet noodle. And then, oh, there's also the sedative hypnotic um, agents. Some of these um, sleeping pills can have a hangover effect. So you wake up in the morning and uh, you're still kind of uh, sedated or, um, or you could even have an anterograde amnesia with some of the short-acting ones, like even Ambien, which is Zolpidem. Patients were describing that around noontime, they realized they didn't remember what had happened for the previous several hours. And so <clears throat> besides causing um, confusion and potential memory loss, um, they could also, again, increase the risk of falls. In fact, pretty much everything on this list besides memory issues also increases the risk of falls, which is another topic for another day. Uh, but some of the other examples here, uh, temazepam, uh, Resteril, Xanax, 
uh, Ativan, all of these really should be avoided in older adults and only used when absolutely, absolutely necessary in discussion with the physician in very small doses. We also have to realize that some of the pain medicines, the strong opioid medicines like morphine or oxycodone can also cause confusion. And then there are the uh, medications that are what we really strictly call the anticholinergics or antispasmodics. And some of these are used for urinary incontinence, um, things like oxybutynin or tolteridine, which is Detrol, Solafenacin, which is the brand name Vesicare. Those um, may help you know, with your bladder, but also may cause confusion. So it's really a balancing act there. And then some of the medications that are used for irritable bowel, like Bentil, which is dicyclamine, or hyoscyamine also have these anticholinergic effects and can cause confusion. So these are all medications. They're actually part of a list of medications called the Beers criteria, which is a list of potentially inappropriate medications. And so we generally, and those of us practicing in geriatrics, try to avoid these agents. There's also some other medications that may contribute to confusion, maybe not directly, but if they cause if you're overdoing it, they can end up causing you to be confused. So diuretics, uh, things like Lasix or hydrochlorothiazide, if you get too dehydrated, if you're too dried out, um, then you can get confused, just like sometimes in the summertime, if you're not drinking enough, that can cause confusion. Certain antihypertensive, luckily these are old ones, clonidine and methyl dopa that we're not using anymore, they directly can affect your memory or cause confusion. But even if you drop your blood pressure too low or your pulse too low, that can cause temporary confusion as well. Indomethacin is an old um, <clears throat> agent in the class of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So the newer ones are things like um, naproxen, which is Aleve, or Motrin, which is ibuprofen. But indomethacin, one of the older ones, has been linked to also causing confusion. And then I list the diabetes medications. They don't directly cause confusion, but if you're over-treated and your blood sugar goes too low, low blood sugar can also cause confusion. So these are all reversible causes, but again, it, well, sometimes when a patient is admitted to the hospital, admitted to the emergency room, and they're confused, they might get uh, inappropriately labeled as someone, as a patient with dementia, when all we have to do is really just fix the medications and then they're confusion disappears. So what do we have for um, Alzheimer's dementia? And these are all approved just for Alzheimer's dementia, though we do use them in uh, other types of dementia. Rivastigmine is actually approved for uh, the dementia that's associated with Parkinson's disease. Um, and there, the first um, three are the cholinesterase inhibitors, and they're approved for mild to moderate dementia. Denepazil also has for more severe dementia. Memantine, which is Nemenda, is actually approved for moderate to severe um, Alzheimer's and has not been shown to be that effective in more milder disease. It's mostly used in combination with one of the three medications above, the denepazil, rivastigmine, or galantamine, and there actually is a combination product, the Dinepazil plus Nemantine, which is Nemzeric. Um, so I say like, do they work? So I wanna show you based on, on a graph of like kind of what we have and what I mean by how well do these drugs work? So what we really have with these drugs is what we call a symptomatic effect. So if you look on the, the lower line is somebody who's on placebo who has dementia and their cognitive function their memory, et cetera, is on the downhill slope. When you give them one of the cholinesterase inhibitor, one of those drugs, or even memantine, it may go up for a bit. This is only about three months or so, but then you see it's still on that downhill decline. So it may stabilize a person for three or so months, but they're still going to decline. So understanding that helps you with it, making the decision of when you're going to use or if you're going to continue the medication. If you're We'll talk about the side effects, but if someone's having a lot of side effects and you're having difficulty in trying to get the medication into the person, don't feel bad if you feel like, is it worth it? Because it may not be worth the hassle or the risk of side effects. And so you want to then, you know, it's okay to discontinue it in, in discussion with the physician. So this is what we have right now. What we really need, we need something that has disease modifying effects. So we need something that 
really just keeps person person pretty much steady. We're not going to necessarily make them better, but we want to prevent them from getting worse. And so the difficulty is when you have somebody who's on one of these medications and you're saying, well, gee, should we take them off of it or not? How much worse can they get? You, you don't really know. And if you do try to take them off of it and then put them back on, you may not necessarily get back to the level that you were before. So um, early on in disease, we do try using these agents, but realizing their limitations that um, in later disease, they're really not that effective. And let's talk about some of the side effects. So the cholinesterase inhibitors, the Aricept, Exelon, and Razodyne, remember I talked about all those agents that cause drying, these have the opposite effect. They're all causing excessive dripping. We call it the sludge effect, salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, and gastric secretions like nausea and vomiting. So besides all this drippiness, um, this could lead, the urination could lead to uh, the patient now being, um, having urinary incontinence. And so then they try to get one of those drugs for urinary incontinence, and now you have medications that are kind of con contradicting each other. Um, if you're having issues with toileting and now you have somebody who has diarrhea, that's certainly not gonna be uh, very effective. And some of the medications, particularly rivastigmine, the oral one, has very severe nausea and vomiting. And so when we dose them, we need to start with a low dose and slowly titrate up. And that's why with rivastigmine, they have the, um, the patch, the Exelon patch, which is actually has a lot less nausea and vomiting. But one of the other side effects, and this is something I, I always test my students on, is that these agents can also slow the heart rate. So it slows your pulse. And many older people are also taking other medications, cardiovascular medications that can also slow the heart rate. So if someone starts on one of these agents and then they faint or have a syncopal episode because their heart rate dropped, it could be because you added one of these drugs to some of the you know, hypertensive medications or medications for uh, atrial fibrillation. So these are, you know, where these, the, the excessive sludge effects may not seem too bad, they can make it difficult sometimes to manage someone at home, but the slow heart rate can also be dangerous. Mementine is, has a different mechanism of action and it's actually very well tolerated and doesn't really cause any of these types of effects. So what other medications have been studied? Um, well, and I have my thumbs down because none of, we don't have any positive really results here. They have studied vitamin E in high doses and it was one where they actually did show maybe it could prevent uh, decline to the point that someone would need to go to a nursing home, but the high doses are not recommended because they can also increase uh, some cardiovascular mortality. And so we, we try not to use like over 400 units of vitamin E a day for anyone. Um, and the studies that were used with using vitamin E used like 2000. Um, we tried some, there were studies looking at some of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, things like naproxen, things like celecoxib, which is Celebrex, thinking that maybe there's something inflammatory going on in the brain. But again, these did not show any positive results. For a while, we thought estrogen would be the fountain of youth and would also help our memory, but then we saw all the kind of uh, concerning effects about estrogen and blood clots and, and potential breast cancer. Um, and when they looked at the memory studies, women on um, estrogen really did not have any improvement in their memory. The statins, again, plus minus, uh, some people feel they get statin brain and feel foggy, and there was some other studies that were trying to see whether adding a statin would help. Uh, really, right now, there's no good evidence for adding a statin just for memory, um, but there's other good reasons for statins. Uh, the monoclonal antibodies is, is the other area where they've been doing a lot of studies, and unfortunately, this week, um, there was um, a another uh, evaluation of one of the uh, newer monoclonal antibodies and um, it was not positive. So the FDA committee did not recommend bringing it on to the full committee. So uh, nothing there yet. It's been quite a while since we've had anything new for dementia and I, I really wish we, we did, but um, nothing really now. So I know you wanted to hear about supplements promoted for memory and a, a few caveats about this. Uh, none of them are FDA approved and supplements don't have to, they, they don't have 
as stringent to regulations. So they don't have to prove safety or effectiveness. Uh, they cannot say they're going to cure or treat an illness. Uh, you'll see the ads for things like Prevagen talking about memory, but they don't talk about dementia. The other thing you have to worry about with some of these supplements is the concerns about purity and the actual content of the product. Um, and, and this is true even for some vitamin products too, um, when they've done studies to see, you know, does it really contain a thousand milligrams of it? Um, there's concern about potential side effects and drug interactions. And we don't know enough about the drug interactions with many of these supplements that are promoted for memory. Um, because they're not really studied in big studies and they're not necessarily looking for these interactions. So some of the com common co products, and I'm going to mention some of these, are uh, Ginkgo, uh, Prevagen, because you just see the commercials all the time, uh, Serifol and NAC, and Cognium. Um, and then my students and I, we were going on, um, we just, you know, Google brain supplements and you get all kinds of things, uh, brain booster, genius consciousness, neuro ignite, neuro gum it's a gum you can choose and give you a, a little boost with your memory i always tell my students these will not help you with um final exams um and these were really not necessarily studied in people with dementia so buyer beware um you have you know you, you got to read the ingredients and sometimes it's hard to you know when you're look you're particularly if you're looking online to get a good view of the ingredients or even if you're in the health food store or wherever um, there's very small print on the back of these. Um, but when we were looking at some of these products, um, some of them contain caffeine, so it's just giving you an immediate jolt. Some of them contain ginkgo, and I'll talk about some of the concerns about using ginkgo. And some of them have like special mixtures that, that aren't even detailed. Um, and, you know, they, I like the one from Cognium, it promotes it's from uh, the uh, silkworm, from the, this protein from a silkworm. Um, and as the active ingredient that's uh, supposedly providing energy and improving nourishment to your brain. We'll talk about Prevagen, some of it, um, and just, you know, again, some of these products. Be very careful. Do not spend your money on them. We'll talk about what you can do. So let's talk a little bit about ginkgo, because ginkgo as, as a, a loan, and ginkgo is in many of these products, it, it comes, we all are familiar with the ginkgo trees, and, and during uh, certain times of the year when the fruit of the ginkgo falls off and it all smells like vomit, um, uh, charming tree. Um, but in studies, and there have been done some really good studies, it has not helped prevent or slow dementia or cognitive decline. And they studied these in uh, people who had dementia and people who had maybe early cognitive decline, uh, but it did not really show any uh, efficacy. Some of the side effects, headache, dizziness, heart palpitations, upset stomach, constipation, allergic reactions. So a lot of things that we don't want. But one of the things I'm most concerned with is that there can be an increased risk of bleeding. And so ginkgo can affect how your platelets um, aggregate, how they clink, clump together. And so if you're taking aspirin or any kind of blood thinner or something like Plavix, you don't want to be taking ginkgo. There have been some cases of uh, increased bleeding with this. Um, also, the, this ginkgo toxin that's found in the seeds of the ginkgo um, fruit can actually cause seizures. Um, ginkgo can interfere with the management of diabetes, and some animal studies showed increased risk of developing liver or thyroid cancers. So um, that's a no for, for ginkgo. <clears throat> also, when you look at some of the studies and you look at what were the recommended doses, um, big variation, big variation. And one study that looked good until you saw that about half the people dropped out of the study. Then we have Prevagen. I don't know how many of these commercials I've been seeing. Um, and it's considered a medical food. And it has this apoacorin, um, which is a photoprotein found in the bioluminescent jellyfish. Not sure how they found this. Not why they decided to look at jellyfish to help with your memory. Um, but basically, there's, there's no data. And they weren't studied in patients with dementia. You know, when you, you see the commercials and these guys say, yeah, my memory's great. My friends tell me I've got the best memory. But they never said that they started off with dementia. They never said it was preventing dementia. Um, and in fact, some of the post-marketing adverse effects actually showed memory impairment. 
and you can see some of the um, uh, side effects also listed here. Headache, dizziness, nausea, hypertension, diarrhea, memory impairment, insomnia, anxiety, stomach pain. You don't hear that on those commercials because unlike drug commercials, they don't necessarily have to list all of that. <clears throat> Another one is Serifol and NAC, which basically is, um, uh, has a bunch of multivitamins, a lot of B vitamins, <clears throat> excuse me, and N-acetylcysteine. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to fix in the brain was to increase the amount of acetylcholine you have. So the thought is with this N-acetylcysteine, your the acetyl group will help maybe give you more uh, acetylcholine. And also you have um, some number number of products that also contain choline itself, but that's a different product. So it, this was FDA approved for treatment or prevention of vitamin deficiencies associated with memory loss. Um, but it it doesn't really the efficacy isn't on the combination product, but it's really looking at the component parts separately. So there's weak data for vitamin B supplementation, and few studies support this in Alzheimer's disease. One showed some significant improvement in late stage Alzheimer's patients. I haven't had any ex experience with this product, but again, you know, use caution with it. Um, side effects, um, nausea, stomach ache, headache. Um, and these are only really the, su the support for this agent would be only in people who have low vitamin levels. And normally we are not testing, you know, vitamin B levels. So um, you'd have to really speak with the doctor about whether this is something worth even trying and, and seeing only if they were deficient in vitamins. So boosting it if you're not deficient isn't going to necessarily help. So those are just a few of them. Some of the other eight things you may see, uh, diamine was listed in one, uh, dimethyl ethanol, which is supposed to increase acetylcholine. Uh, another one, like I said, is contains actual choline, um, but um, it, it, which they're describing it as also part of the B vitamin family, but it really isn't. So what is recommended for memory? Um, I started doing the uh, New York Times crossword puzzles, but actually what they really recommend is exercise, physical exercise. Um, and they've done studies, um, including patients at risk or with Alzheimer's disease, and found that exercise training may delay the decline in cognitive function that occurs in individuals who are at risk or have Alzheimer's disease, and that aerobic exercise may have the most favorable effects. So get out um, you know, before the weather gets too cold and walk and do some exercising. I know it's kind of hard with these COVID days and being inside, but it really is important. Um, and also they say, you know, learning something new. So, you know, even dancing, you know, if you're learning the steps, uh, uh, learning, you know, they talk about learning new languages or a musical instrument, which is sometimes tough to do, but really physical exercise, because it's not just good for your brain, it's good for other parts of your body. And the World Health Organization recommends, these are the, the recommendations for, um, uh, older for adults and older adults. Um, if I got to this, it would be great. But you know, over 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity exercise, or greater than 75 minutes a week of vigorous intensity. But also looking again, going back to talking about falls and fall prevention, um, balance and fall prevention activities uh, greater than three or more days a week, and muscle strengthening activities two or more days a week. And all these things again, besides you know may helping with your, your physical health and keeping you from falling may also help with your, with your memory as well and your brain. Um, and you know, I can't overemphasize the importance of preventing falls and preventing hip fractures, particularly hip fractures. We're seeing a lot of people who are not you know, getting good exercise and then they're at risk for falls. And being in the hospital and undergoing hip surgery has also shown you know, some you know, post-op delirium and confusion, um, and that is not good for anybody. I want to talk a little bit about symptomatic management because you know there are times when, particularly if you're caring for a loved one at home, uh, and they have behaviors that are very difficult to to manage. Um, we want to avoid the antipsychotic medications. They have this black box warning. So the antipsychotics are things like Seroquel, which is quetiapine. Uh, Zyprexa, um, Risperidone, and the old ones, Hal Haliperidol, which is Haldol. 
And what they saw was that when used for patients, older adults with dementia, there was an increased risk of uh, cerebrovascular events, including strokes and death. And so we only, and in nursing homes, we only use these if they're really the last resort. We try non-pharmacologic measures um, first, and only if a person is a danger to themselves or other people, or if their psychotic behaviors, the hallucinations are causing them uh, distress or impairing their ability. They won't eat because they think the food's poisoned or won't take a shower because the shot water's poisoned. And then only in small doses and for a short period of time. And so really to try to avoid those antipsychotics. We also want to avoid the benzodiazepines, those drugs I mentioned early on that can affect your memory, uh, Ativan and Xanax. Uh, we think we're helping people, helping them to go to sleep, but that can actually cause more memory impairment. Um, it's not necessarily going to make the dementia worse or give you dementia if you don't have dementia. That, that's been debated, but um, it, it will impair your the short-term memory. So it really is to focus on non-pharmacologic management, um, you know, music therapy. I just saw something that I shared on Facebook that was beautiful of this uh, elderly woman who had been a ballerina and in Swan Lake, and they, they played the music for her and she started moving her arms and you saw that she was actually still remembered all the movements uh, from uh, the ballet. Uh, amazing. Um, exercise, getting back to the exercise, having a calm, familiar environment, and also thinking about why if this person is having some of these behaviors that we like to talk about, the I hate using the word agitation, but that's sometimes what we see, you know, figuring out what's wrong. Is the patient hungry? Are they tired? Are they bored? Are they in pain? Are they sitting in a soiled diaper? Are they constipated? And trying to treat all those things um, and fix those things before reaching for medication. We really, you know, in the nursing home particularly, you know, when someone says, you know, you gotta do something, you gotta give her something, we really try to avoid that. And many times people will work through the symptomatic period and at times of the psychosis that you can, if they were on any of these agents, get them off of it. There also were studies looking at antidepressants, particularly they were looking at um, uh, citalopram, uh, Celexa, um, but they were using it in higher doses. So there was a little bit of concern with that and some side effects. So I want to just shift gears now and talk about how to manage your medications. And this is whether it's for you or for your loved one. Um, and it is hard to remember to take medicines. Um, and there are a lot of different gadgets out there to help you. There's the simplest things with the pill boxes that we have that just, you know, one box for each day of the week, which is great if you're taking medication once a day. If you're taking it more than once a day, you can get the ones that are for a week that each day will come out with up to four boxes. Or you could just buy two of the regular, you know, the weekly ones. Um, there are timers. This is one that would fit on a cap of a, of a bottle. People are using apps for their phone. Uh, this gadget attaches to the phone system and it's basically filled with up to, a, I think up to a month's worth of medication. And it will, you can set the time, what time to take it. And if the person does not push the button to open the device, we'll dispense the medication. Then it's attached to the phone, and whoever is the first caller can call and say, "Hey, mom, you didn't, um, you didn't, uh, you know, push the button. You didn't take your medicine. So can you do that now? You know, are you okay?" Um, and these are uh, through some of the companies that have the uh, I call them the, you know, help I've fallen and they can't get up uh, devices, Philips Lifeline and some of the other ones have these medication reminders. And so these can be useful if you have somebody in the home who can't really administer the medication could be help reminder. So when the, the timer goes off, either on the fancy one or a simple one, you can say, it's time to take your medicine, let's take the medicine. And then just even making a simple calendar. Maybe it's uh, somebody who was admitted with taking a whole bunch of new medicines. And so having a list of the medications and how many pills at each time, uh, dosing time is useful, and particularly if you're then filling a, one of those pill boxes that makes it easier to fill it. Some pharmacies also dispense the medications in poly packs where all your morning medicines are in one little uh, plastic uh, container uh, that you just, you know, um, you tear open. Uh, the problem with some of those is if there's any change in medications and you have to remember that you gotta take out the pink pill or the blue pill. So you don't want those filled for too long a period of time. 
And then how to use your pharmacist, how to utilize your pharmacist. And I know a lot of people say, oh, I go into the pharmacies and they're so busy and I didn't, don't get a chance. But by law in New York State, the pharmacist has to come out and counsel you about your new medication. And they're supposed to really ask if you have any questions anytime you come for a refill. So these are some of the things that you should ask in case the pharmacist hasn't asked you, do you have questions? You always want to make sure you know what the name of the medication is and what it's for. Because again, Diane, many times I ask patients in the nursing home when they come in, you know, you know your medicines, what were you taking at home? Oh yeah, yeah, I do. I said, well, what were the names? Said, oh, you want the names of the medicine? Said, yeah, we need to know the names. Um, and know when and how to take it. And what does that mean when I say, you know, what time, if it's once a day, is it best in the morning? Is it best in the evening? Some of the medications like uh, Denepazil or Aricept, some patients find it's better to take it in the evening case it causes any drowsiness. How do you take it? Um, you know, do you take it with food? Do you take it on an empty stomach? And what does that mean? How long before or after a meal? Um, usually if it's on an empty stomach, we say an hour before or two hours after a meal. We'd say with food, make sure you have something in your stomach. Ask how long you're going to be taking it. Is this like an antibiotic that you take for a week or 10 days? Or is this something you're going to take the rest of your life and maybe have dosage adjustments? Ask about the side effects. I know we staple information onto the bag and you get all the small print about all the information about the medicine, but ask what you should be concerned with and what to do if you have a side effect. That's very important. Do I call the doctor? Will, it go, will the side effect go away? Should I stop the medicine? What should I do? Also ask what you should be avoiding. You know, most of the time we're gonna say, don't take your medicine with a glass of wine, but you know, if you, you know, Thanksgiving's coming up and maybe you're Zooming Thanksgiving, ask if you can, you know, have a little bit of wine or alcohol um, with the medications you're taking. Ask about the other medications you're on. Make sure you take all your prescriptions to the same pharmacy so we can look and see what your different doctors are giving so that your cardiologist isn't giving you something that interferes with what your gastroenterologist mm -hmm. gave you or your internist or things aren't double, double dosed. Ask about foods. Is there anything we should be avoiding? And are there any certain activities to avoid? If it's a medication that causes drowsiness, we will put a little label on the bottle that says, don't drive or operate heavy machineries or engage in dangerous activities until you know how this medicine affects you. What does that mean besides driving? Um, it means even, say, getting up on a step stool and reaching up for a uh, uh, to a tall shelf. You could lose your balance if this is a medication that causes any kind of sedation. What should you do if you miss a dose? Well, hopefully you won't if you have your nice uh, pill boxes with you, but generally we'll tell you if it's more than half of the time to the next dose, then just skip it. If it's less than that, you can, you can take it and fit in your doses. So it's uh, noon time around, and I forgot my morning medicine, and that's then it's okay to take it. But if it's Dinner time or bedtime, you realize you didn't take your morning medicine, just skip it, start over tomorrow. And ask where to store this medication. And most of the time we will tell you to keep it in a cool, dry place, away from heat, away out of the reach of children, and not in the bathroom, which can be too humid. And then some of the do's and don'ts. And these are very important, particularly as we talk about with, with family members. Don't share medicine, even with family members. You know, don't say, oh, you know, you can't sleep here. Take one of my pills. No. As I said, some of those medications can be particularly detrimental in older people anyway. Don't keep expired or discontinued medications. Most pharmacies now have, um, particularly the chain pharmacies, do have a, a kiosk where you can, you can dump expired or, or discontinued medications. Um, if you're disposing them at home, don't flush them. Just empty the bottle into the garbage, mix it in so that no one's going to want to take those tablets. And as far as expired medications, things like over-the-counter medicines, uh, the rule of thumb is that uh, as we change the clocks, which we just did, and you change the batteries and your smoke alarms, that you should also take a look at your over-the-counter medications and get rid of anything that's expired. Now, people always say, well, it expired at the end of October, and now we're in November. All right. So, you know, it's obviously I got a headache today. I'm going to take the Tylenol today. But I'm also going to sit and write down on my list to buy fresh Tylenol because I want my medication to work. It's not that necessarily the medication turns bad, but you want it to be 100 percent effective. So uh, I do get rid of expired medications. 
Also, don't stop a medicine just because you feel better, unless that's what the doctor told you to do. And always store the medications in the original bottle, particularly if you're traveling. You want to bring, if anyone's traveling these days, uh, bring your medications in the original bottle. So in case anything happens, wherever you're going, you have all the medication information with you. And if you miss a dose, don't try to, to catch up by doubling the next dose. We mentioned that earlier. And always keep medications out of the reach of children, even if it's in a child-resistant container. It's only child-resistant, not child-proof, and your grandchildren or great-grandchildren can get into them quicker than you can. Keep a record of your allergies or side effects of medications. Tell your doctor and your pharmacist if you think you're experiencing a side effect, and then again, what to do about it. And we'll let you know whether we, that we think it's an allergy or a side effect. Always bring your current medications, or at least an updated list with you when you visit a hospital, dentist, or admitted to the hospital. Um, very important that we know what you're taking, then it's up to date. Many people now are keeping the list on their phone, but if you're unconscious and we can't unlock your phone, that's not gonna help, help us. And always read the labels when you're taking medication. Don't trust your memory. You know, you, you make, we wanna make sure you picked up the right bottle. You wanna make sure you know exactly how to take it and check and see, did the, maybe the directions change since the last time the doctor prescribed it for you. And always ask questions. If you don't understand the directions, ask the pharmacist. Don't be afraid to call us after you get home, even if you, know, if you forgot to ask us something when you're in the pharmacy. Don't guess. Um, if you use a mail order pharmacy, you can call their 800 number and ask questions of the pharmacist there too. So hopefully this has all been helpful for you. And I believe that brings us to our question time. Kara, if anyone has questions, and I'll, I'll even turn on my video so you can see me. Yes, definitely. And we are getting a lot of thank yous for covering this topic. It's something that is definitely needed. Um, you know, someone else saying thank you for doing this because it is really important um, work. So I'll get started on one of the first questions that we have. Um, is how does melatonin um, affect a person? Okay, that's a very good question. So, you know, I mentioned all those sleeping pills that we don't like to use in older adults, and melatonin is kind of what we've gone to instead, because people always say, well, what can I take? Um, melatonin is interesting, because our body does secrete melatonin, and it's also used for um, jet lag, um, and so to kind of help reset your clock. So mm -hmm. when they use it for jet lag, they use a very small dose and give it like late afternoon, which kind of tells the body that, you know, like in six hours, it'll be bedtime. So we started using it, in, you know, I've seen anywhere from one milligram to 10 milligrams for sleep. I personally have never taken it. Some patients love it. Some people say it works. Some people say it doesn't work. So it's certainly worth a try because it doesn't seem to have any hangover effect or side effects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, and then we have another person who has asked, recently they came out with a new antihistamine um, called, I'm gonna hopefully pronounce this correctly, Exil, X-Y-Z-A-L. Is that oh, a safer pick in the other ones you've mentioned? Yeah, it is It is also one of the safer ones. It's one of the newer ones, what we call the second generation. So anything like Benadryl, even, um, we had somebody the other day take, still taking chlortrimeton, chlorphenia. Those are the old ones that have all those side effects. So, you know, you still have to be careful with Zyzal and Zyrtec. They can uh, cause some sedation. So if you do take it, take it at bedtime. Uh, Claritin is a little bit less drowsy. Um, mm -hmm. Allegra is less drowsy also. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have someone, um, she, she's actually working with clients. Um, she said, does estrogen increase the risk of dementia because she has clients that um, are either on the oral or the cream um, version? Well, it, it, it's, it's really debatable whether it causes more. It depends on the type of estrogen. And that was the answer that was never gotten from some of the studies. But one of them, the women who are on estrogen seem to have a higher risk. Um, but the cream is probably safer because that's just more of a local effect. So I wouldn't worry about the cream. But most older women don't need to be taking um, the oral estrogen anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and then I do have someone who's asked, what are the advantages of using Nam, I'm probably gonna say this wrong, so my apologies, um, Namzeric rather than Aricept and Namida? Namida, uh, it's just one pill. I mean, so some people might find that it's easier 
to rather it, but it's more expensive. So Aricept is generic and Memantine, Memantine or Nemenda is also generic. So uh, if you gave those two generic, it might be cheaper than the Numzera. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then we have someone else who now just asked, have you, have you heard um, a doctor and, you know, where did, no, sorry, one moment. It just kind of like left me. I'm so sorry. Okay. Have you heard a doctor saying that Ambien is okay in a small dosage, like 5-MG, and your thoughts, not sure if that's something you can address or not. Oh, yeah. So for Ambien, the recommended dose for women and older adults is five milligrams, but that still can be a, a decent sized dose in an older person and still can cause sedation. And it is um, one of those drugs on the beers criteria. It's been associated with falls and mm -hmm. uh, with confusion. So we really do try to, to avoid it, you know, even the five milligram. And then some people say, well, what if I take two and a half? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Like, let's just try to figure out why you're not sleeping, you know, and, and really look at that's a whole nother talk about how to how to good sleep hygiene and, and how to how to sleep. And also look at any medications that might be keeping you awake, too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think it's like you mentioned before, if you're taking all these other medications, some can interact differently and cause other side symptoms as well. Right. Right. And mm -hmm. also, you know, you might be taking. Um, several different medications that may not have shown up on that list, but when you add it all together, could have the same kind of sedating effect or confusion effect uh, as some of the ones on that list. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we do have a gentleman who asked, um, what are your thoughts on probi probiotics playing a role in cognition um, and thoughts on any new therapies to help with cognitive decline? So I guess that's, a, that's more of a two-for-one question. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I have not really heard anything about or seen any studies with the probiotics, so I, I can't mm -hmm. I can't address that. And as far as the anything else, like I said, you know, look, I I was I, I literally found this website that had like the top ten brain mm -hmm. boosters, or brain supplements, and and reading through them all, you know, it was just a lot of claims, but not necessarily a study that I was gonna find in the, you know, a reputable journal, like the New England Journal of Medicine or something, or that were studied in Alzheimer patients. So I'm, I'm very cautious with those because I think you're wasting money and you could have things that are causing interactions with your regular prescriptions, um, side effects we don't know about. So I, I would mm -hmm. caution. On that, definitely. I wish, I wish I had good news. I wish I had something that I could say, we're all going to go out. We're all going to go take a walk. But I think everyone can say we appreciate getting, you know, getting this information so that way we're on the right path in terms of how we're doing these things. So definitely getting that. Um, we do have someone who asked, um, how long um, is the recommendation for typical Alzheimer's medications in terms of doctors prescribing them? That's a good question also. And I, I sometimes I leave that up to the families to say, like, how, what kind of effect they think they saw in the patient and also are they having any of the side effects? You know, are they having problems with with urination that might be due to the medication, not just incontinence from a you know bladder issue? Um, and are, is it difficult to give the medication? They there are they are generic now, so cost is not that much of an issue, except yeah. for the patch. I believe is still more expensive. So I, I say that's a, a discussion to have with the family and to also be realistic about what it can and can't do. Um, I know from personal experience, my mom had uh, uh, Alzheimer's dementia, and um, the doctor initially tried uh, Denepazil, Aricep, and in, I think it actually made her angrier. Um, and then she also looked it up in a book and got really upset, like, who said I have Alzheimer's? How does the doctor know that? Why are they giving me this drug? And so that just did not work out very well. Mm -hmm. And that's important to know what's going to work for one person might not work for someone else because right. this disease is so individualistic at times. And I and I see people who are also taking Aricep because they, they complain to the doctor they have problems with their memory. And we all forget things at times, but I don't think they, these are people who necessarily had dementia. And so they're taking this, which may not really necessarily be doing anything for them either. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's why it's important to, to talk about, you know, the differences with dementia and normal aging and having those conversations with your doctors, having all your doctors or your, your team of them aware 
of everything as well as your pharmacist being on your team and them being aware of everything that's going on. Exactly. Yeah. And and, yeah. and it's it's not a bad idea to also talk to the pharmacist and just say, you know, can you review my whoever the patient, the loved one's medication? Is there anything here that could be impairing their memory? You know, because sometimes mm -hmm. the doctor may not take the time or may not be looking at all the different drugs. So if you have the pharmacist who's really looking at, you know, all the medications that come into the pharmacy, they can maybe help you with that. And also make sure that you mention any over-the-counter medicines. Um, and I will put in a plug for uh, looking for a pharmacist who's board certified in geriatric pharmacy. Uh, that's the BCGP after my name. And, and there's a good 3,000 or more of them through the U.S., um, you can even look us up to, to do private consultations to review the list of medications. And I think at least once a year, um, doctors should, you know, the main doctor should be looking at the medications. And also if they're using a geriatrician, that's usually part of the standard part of a geriatric evaluation is medication review. Mm -hmm. Definitely, especially, um, you know, as you've done before, the brown bag medication where you go through and have someone bring Mm -hmm. in their medication as well yeah. so they can understand what they're for right or needed. Mm -hmm. um, we do have someone who who asked and again if I, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing it right <laughs> but, um, what about the Bredesen protocol um, is that is something um, you've worked with or not and your thoughts on it the what protocol it's um the called the Bredesen protocol b-r-e-d-e-s-e-n that I'm might not be familiar more with it. With physician um, is what I'm thinking. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it. Yep. Um, our next question is someone who said, "If is, are there any medications that we should be wary of if our person um, needs to go into surgery or not that could cause more cognitive issues?" Well, um, it, it part of it is actually the the anesthesia itself. In, in older people, our bodies contain a higher percentage of fat and anesthesia is bound to fat. So when someone comes out of surgery, it's gonna take longer mm -hmm. for them to kind of fully wake up because it takes longer to get rid of all that anesthesia mm -hmm. and certainly any of the pain medicines. I mean, pain itself can cause confusion um, mm -hmm. and agitation, but the medication, so you're balancing it. And I know I, I deal with a lot of families. Oh, don't give mom any oxycodone. I was like, okay, I'll break your hip and I won't give you any pain medicine. <laughs> and um, so it's balancing it and giving smaller doses. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, if you're knowing ahead going into surgery, that's something to discuss with the doctor, um, certain medications that they want to continue right up to surgery, some that may want to start, you know, stop, you know, a week before mm -hmm. something if it's a blood thinner. But knowing coming out of surgery can sometimes take longer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And again, it, how important it is to have these conversations. And so I'm very thankful we're getting many people asking about, you know, these different types of questions to be asking um, mm -hmm. all the people on the medical team. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Do you someone, I have another question where someone has asked, um, what are the thoughts on certain medications for sundowning? Um, and if they are effective or not effective. So that's usually then getting to the antipsychotics. That's, those are yeah. the ones that we often use, and that's the ones that I say we really try to avoid because of the black box warning. You know, they're approved for schizophrenia, for bipolar, sometimes used adjunct for, uh, for uh, depression, but you know, in nursing homes, they were used in what we called chemical restraints. And then we saw that they were actually causing more harm, particularly when you first start them. So unless somebody really has a bad case of the, that you really, they're a danger to themselves or they're a danger to other people, we try to avoid them. And, and if you can um, predict that, you know, okay, you know, now it's getting, you know, what time they start to sundown, can you use non-pharmacologic interventions um, mm -hmm. and, and prevent it, um, keeping them active, keeping, um, you know, them in, you know, engaged. Uh, I know that's hard. I know I, I again live with this with my mom. Um, the other thing is some of the one of the other medications that's sometimes tried more for aggression is um, valproic acid, Depakote, Depakine, which are it's an anti seizure medicine. And again, plus minus results with it. Sometimes using it in small doses, they found in people who were particularly physically aggressive um, that. Uh, 
using it, but it's kind of fallen from favor. We just had somebody on it and it did not work very well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I, and, and that definitely happens. And I, and I think from speaking from, um, you know, me being a social worker, when I work with behaviors, we are really trying to understand um, what's the underlying message of the behavior as a form of communication. Right. Um, as Dr. Beisner mentioned, you know, seeing if they're hungry or they in pain that they can't communicate with us, um, doing things to try and help soothe and calm the person, um, you know, as they are sundowning as much as possible. Right. Or is there something that triggers from their memory that this was when they would always go home, you know, leave work? Mm -hmm. you know, I had somebody who always tried to leave at a certain time because that was when they would go home and they had to cook dinner, you know, and, and, we had the daughter call and say, mom, you know, I'm not going to be home for dinner. Don't worry about it. And that kind of calmed her down. So she didn't have to worry mm -hmm. what she was for dinner. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that we, you always hear these kinds of stories and it's hard to believe the things. You know, I found I used to calm my mom with chocolate ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Went, Want some ice cream? Sure. Yeah. OK. It's the third cup she's had a day. But who cares? You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Harm, harm reduction. It helps. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We've had it had a few questions on, on this, and I definitely think this also depends on, you know, state-wise and research, but many people, you know, moving along are asking about, you know, medical marijuana. How is this wow. even being used with Alzheimer's? You know, and, and that really depends on, you know, what state you're in, um, who are the doctors you're working um, with in this? Yeah, and no, I, I don't, it's not approved in New York, I believe, for dementia. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, there hasn't been a lot studied for for that. You know, some people are yes. saying CBD oil is for anxiety. Maybe it'll help. But again, you have to balance that because you don't want to sedate somebody and put them at risk for falls. Um, exactly. So um, I would be very cautious. And I don't, you know, it's hard to do good studies with uh, medical marijuana or even CBD because um, they're, you know, well, mar medical marijuana is a controlled substance. CBD oil. You know, no one wants to fund that type of research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it's like you said, we don't know what um, could happen if the person's having it. And we definitely think of, you know, risk factors in the home. If someone were on something and they tripped over a rug, all these different things can come into combination um, with it. And we also don't know all the medications that that individual is on that could be exacerbated um, because of taking that for some reason. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep, definitely. Um, I do have someone who has asked, um, again, apologies for <laughs> not pronouncing these correctly. Okay. Um, does astorvastatin or other blood pressure, um, such as cholesterol medication, have an impact on memory? And I think you touched on this um, I a did, bit. yeah. So ator atorvastatin is one of the statins. That's that's the generic yeah. of the ator. And there have been some studies because there was some thought about uh, cholesterol in the brain and stuff. Unclear. Um, and as I said, some people actually complain about um, statin brain where they feel foggy. So it, it's not um, hmm. not anything that you know we're gonna like promote just to take it for your memory or anything like that. Uh, but there's other good reasons to be taking statins, you know, if you have an indication for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And none of the other, none of the other cholesterol medicines have, have, have I've seen anything about memory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do have someone else. We're getting so many questions, so I, I really appreciate this, okay. Dr. Reisner. Um, we do have someone who has asked, you know, um, what about side effects? Of tr I'm going to say this wrong again, tr trazodone. Trazodone, okay. That's another medication that's often, it's an antidepressant, but they've often used it in small doses for sleep. Um, mm -hmm. And in, in small doses, it, it may be helpful, um, you know, like 25 milligrams, um, but it, it is sedating. So you have to be careful that you don't overdo it and then make the person at risk for falls. It, it doesn't have mm -hmm. the anticholinergic drying effects as much as some mm -hmm. of the other older antidepressants. So it has been tried also. Um, but again, you know, it has this sedating effect. So you just have to be careful, particularly if they're on any other medications that cause sedation. Mm -hmm. Is there anything, because I have someone who just mentioned this, because, um, you know, just touching on 
um, the pandemic, is there anything you would recommend to um, people to um, prepare or think about um, in the next coming months if they are caring for someone or um, recently diagnosed themselves? Oh, wow. Well, if they're caring for someone, I think, and that's probably down your alley is, is, is self-care for them. Um, and, and, you know, <laughs> trying to make sure that, you know, as we, you know, looks like we're going to all go on to some kind of lockdown or a lot of closures to how do we have an outlet to um, take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and that gets into, you know, good sleep and diet and all that. Um, you know, what if I have my magic book? my magic ball to you know my to tell you about the uh vaccines it's you know it sounds very good with the pfizer vaccine and the moderna vaccine mm -hmm. sounds like it's coming up right behind when we actually will get it and when and who gets it first second and third that's going to be a while you know they're talking mm -hmm. about you know, medical uh health care health care providers first responders people in nursing homes mm -hmm. um so um it's i and i you know it as we talked earlier, it can be very difficult when you're taking care of somebody or someone's in a facility uh, during these times. So self-care. And, and I think just preparing ahead of time. So like you said, talking with your pharmacist, um, mm -hmm. if there's ways to get certain medications or scripts yeah. in a certain- So you can get three months at a time. Yeah, if, you, if you're not getting three months, you can get three months at a time, um, making sure they deliver, ask if they can deliver or somebody else could be picking up the prescriptions for you. Those are important things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so with that, we are going to wrap up today. Thank you so much for being with us today. You know, I really wanted to go through um, some of the comments that we've received, um, you know, about having you here. Um, someone said, I've attended several medication trainings over the years um, through the course of you know, learning. And she said this was really the best that she's ever attended. And it's very helpful for her. Well, thank you. Yeah. My pleasure to be here. And I have a few other people saying thank you. Um, can we get the, the PowerPoint for those of you? Um, if you see the handouts on the side, they are there um, for you to um, see. We also, obviously, once um, the session wraps up, we will have it posted on our website. So it's something that um, you can refer to, um, you know, as you are going through, if you have more questions. Um, certainly, you connect with me um, as well as Dr. Beisner, who um, has their information on the first slide if you need um, to connect about questions or thoughts and things like that. Yeah, they can email me. That's fine. My email is mm -hmm. on the first slide, so that's that's fine. Mm -hmm. Or reach out through you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm still getting all the, the thank yous. Great, informative <laughs> session. Okay. Excellent presentation. Makes it easier for me to care for my loved one. Um, so thank you so much for being here with us today and really going through all of this. Sometimes it can be hard with all the jargon to understand. Um, so I greatly appreciate you being here with all of us. Okay, great. All right. Be safe, everybody. Wear your mask. Take Wash care. your hands. <laughs> Take care. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.